All right. So what I'd like to do is uh, dive into chapter four, if you don't mind. Is everyone excited about chapter four? Yes, I love it. I got a response and a positive one at that. Okay. Hit this. Hit this. Erase what I can. Because we're going to need the board space. That's coming on. Let's see if I can get through this with very few mess ups. <laughs> so I'm in a new room, so give me a little cushion here because it'll throw me off my game, right? Okay. I feel claustrophobic up there all of a sudden. <laughs> so I want to talk about the income statement tonight primarily. Um, but again, remember the whole concept of we want to understand the business. We want to know what they do, how they do it, and then we start to analyze the financials like with things like common sizing like I just showed you. Um, the big part of this is just a reminder whose responsibility it is to prepare good financial statements. Is it the auditors? No. Do the auditors prepare financial statements? Everyone say no. Okay. The auditors look at financial statements prepared by management and they state, they give their opinion as to whether or not it's, they're stated fairly. That's all they do. Okay. Um, we talked about relevant and reliable. Yes. There's lots of components of reliable, you know, accuracy, uh, consistency. Are you reporting things the same way from year to year? So if you're looking at, like we just did, three years side by side, you want there to be that consistency so that they are uh, relevant to each other. Think about it. If we changed a whole bunch of G&A expenses and moved them and called them something else, was that ratio that I just did, would it have meaning anymore? No. So you lose part of the communication uh, unless you're consistent. You have to yes. If it's significant, yes. So, okay, those of you who had accounting 151A, there's a great circle that shows the accounting cycle. For those of you who haven't, um, let me walk you through it. This one's a little different. So at the beginning of an accounting cycle, say the beginning of a month or a year, what accountants do is we take the transactions, you know, the invoices where you're billing customers or invoices where you're being billed from a, 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 a vendor, and you analyze them and you record them in the general ledger. So far we've been using key accounts to represent the general ledger, correct? Okay. And we post the T accounts or the, the journal entries to the general ledger, which is what we've been doing. You take those and you create a trial balance and you do adjustments to the revenue and expenses for what's called cutoff. Cutoff in a, in a very, I'm going to go through lots of examples of cutoff tonight, but an example is we had one that said, oh, record the uh, tel telephone bill for $420 that you will pay next month. Okay, think about it. Cash doesn't leave until next month, but I incurred the expense when? This month. So I want to record the expense this month to match it with the revenues that it generated. Okay? Um, that's what adjustments are all about, the matching principle. After we do those adjustments, then we prepare the financial statements. Cool? So we've done, we've done this, all this so far, except I haven't shown you the adjustments. Tonight, we're going to talk about adjustments and cutoff. Let's see, close revenues, expenses to retained earnings. We'll talk about that later too. Remember, what is, what is uh, revenues minus expenses? Net income. net income. Net income does what to retained earnings? Increases it, yes. Net loss, 
makes retained earnings go? Down. That's all you need to know there. And then you start the cycle over again. Good? Good. All right. Um, unadjusted trial balance. That's part of why I did one tonight. We did the trial balance. Everybody remembers? It's a list of all of your accounts in assets, liabilities, stockholders, equity, revenue, expense order. Cool? Uh, enter the debit and credit. You total them and you show that you're in balance. That's all it is. Is it a financial statement? Is it one of the four financial statements? No. It is just a tool. We don't ever publish it or show it to the world. So here's a great example of a trial balance. It has all of the elements starting with who, what, and when. It lists assets, liabilities, stockholders' equity. I'm assuming revenue and expenses are down there somewhere. Didn't fit on the slide. Debits and credits. And we can total these up and show we're in balance. Without the revenue, <coughs> excuse me, without the revenue and expense accounts, will we be in balance? No. No, not a chance. There they are. All right. Now we're in balance. <laughs> The revenue and expense accounts without the balance sheet accounts will we be in, about, in balance? Not a chance. You need them all. But in total, all of them were in balance. That's a trial balance. Everybody's comfortable with this. Good refresher. Okay. Um, the matching principle is simply what I was explaining earlier. Uh, I know I've incurred an expense. We run a factory. The lights are on. We're running machinery. The end of the month comes. The, the utility bill has not come yet. Have I incurred an expense? Yep. I'm going to owe them money, right? Do I know how much it is? I do not. But I want to record an expense in the same month that I have the revenue, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make an estimate or I'm going to do something to match those expenses with the revenue. And that's what these adjustments are. Everybody with me? Okay. Um, this is about as hard as I could make it. <laughs> let's, uh, let's skip it. Here's what I want to do. I want to show you the markers over there. <laughs> you see that one? Yep. All the way over here? Okay. There are a couple of different kinds of adjustments. So let's think about this. Let's talk about the expense adjustments first. There's a couple of scenarios, and I think we talked about this. I get the invoice and pay in cash. Do I have a problem here? No. no, I get the invoice, I record it the same day, right? No problem. This is what we've been talking about all along. Two is, I have no invoice and I record the expense. This is my example of the utility bill. The utility bill doesn't come until the 5th or the 8th of the month, but I want to record the expense in January, even though the bill doesn't come until February 8th. Okay? The third one is, I pay you now, and I use the item later. Pay you now, use the item later. Anybody have a thought on what that is? Prepaid rent. Okay, It's all about when does the money change hands. Same time, money changes later, money changes first. Those are the three choices. Cool? Okay. I'm not going to worry about the first one. We've all got that down. Yes? Okay. So the second one is, the utility bill comes on the 8th, and we'll, we'll, yeah, I'll pay it sometime in February. So this is January. The utility bill comes February 
8. So on January 31, what do I record? I make an estimate. What do we think our utility bill is going to be this month? Uh, $600. $600. So I will record uh, utility expense, and I debit that for $600. Am I paying the cash? No. 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 So what is it? I owe it later. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, what if in January you paid for the one in December? There's going to be an expense already there for the utility. Yeah, absolutely. But that's from November. Right? Yeah. So, let me just walk through this and I'll show you how it works. Bear with me and if I don't answer it, you can, you can stop me. So think this through for a second. I debit the expense. I, rec I record the accounts payable. In red, this is the following month. This is February. What do I do? The accounts payable goes down. And I give up the cash then. Everybody see that? These wash each other out. And you end up with the same transaction you would have if it happened at the same time, but in different months. Good? Yes. Sir? So, what if the utility bill came next month and it was 560? And that's exactly what will happen. Yeah. Okay? So, next month, when, well, when you actually pay this, let's say it's a little more, just to make it simple. Okay, the utility bill comes and it's 610. So we would actually pay cash of 610, accounts payable of 600 to wipe this out. This has to go to zero. And we would have <coughs> utility expense of 10. We missed it by 10. Oh well, it's immaterial. But we made our good estimate back here to get most of it in the right accounting period. Okay? And if it, if it was less, we'd go the other way. This still needs to be 600. We'd actually reduce utility expense and we would send less cash. And most people get crazy when I credit an expense. But this is what trues it up. And it's not a big deal. Because again, in, in, January, or in March, you're going to have about another $600 bill. So it won't look like my balance is negative for the month. OK? It's a matter of making sure, just making sure everything's in balance and correcting your estimate. Right. But no matter what, accounts payable goes to zero, in and out. OK? You'd rather be as close as you can get. Over or under doesn't, doesn't matter. I asked the same question when I was a student. So this is when you pay after, or pay later in example two. Everybody good? OK. Yes. Yes. That knocked out about six slides right there. <laughs> nice and easy. The only remaining option is we pay first. That's an R, not an E. <laughs> so when we pay first, what do we do? We have prepaid rent. P P D rent. Six thousand dollars. And I give them the cash now. So I debit this asset called prepaid rent and I credit cash. I don't have the cash anymore. Let's say that's six months worth of rent. How much is my rent every month? A thousand bucks, right? Did the math easy on purpose. <laughs> it's after seven o'clock. <laughs> so I've given up the cash. Do I have an expense yet? No, because I haven't used it up. But the month of February goes, I'm sorry, we're working in January, right? January comes and goes, and at the end of the month, I've now used up a month of rent. So at the end of the month, what do I record? 
Okay, I have rent, expense, and that's a debit because expenses are debits, $1,000. And what have I given up? Cash? Prepaid no, remember, I paid him the cash before. So prepaid, rent, that asset goes down. All right? So this cancels part of this, and I only have a balance left of 5000 going forward. Cool? That's all three scenarios. Easy. Easy peasy. Now let me mess it up. <laughs> no, actually it's just as easy. I'm going to leave the dates because nothing else changes. Um, we have three scenarios. Those were expenses. Now let's do revenue. Fair? Okay, scenario one. You give the merchandise at the same time you get cash. Same time. Right? This is what we've been doing all along. Piece of cake. Everybody's good with this. Okay, scenario two. I give merchandise and I get cash later. What is this? Accounts receivable. They're going to pay us. Okay? AR. Okay? Scenario three. On the flip side, um, I get cash now and I give merchandise later. This would be I get paid dollars first. Anybody have a, uh, an example of Lawyers getting paid first? Lawyers, they want a retainer, right? That would be unearned. unearned revenue. Magazine subscriptions, right? You go sign up for People Magazine, you pay them up front for a whole year, but they don't earn it until they send you each issue, however often they come. Yes, gift cards are the same thing. If you buy a gift card to Target or whatever, they got the cash, but they haven't earned anything yet because they didn't give you merchandise. How about buying things online? If you buy things online, they want the money right now. They do want the money right now, but they don't send it to you right now. Sometimes. But if they're putting it in a UPS box and shipping it today, they record it like this. Okay? That way they don't have to track when you receive it to go and do another entry. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. What happens to gift cards if they don't get redeemed? Who in here is doing Target or anybody doing any of the big retailers? No? Okay. <clears throat> Usually someone will do the Target one and uh, they have a great big section in their notes that talks about we record gift cards as a liability and we record the revenue when we give the merchandise and they redeem the gift card. However, gift cards that are outstanding longer than, and they have some number, 18 months, we just write them off and call them all revenue. Because there's some percentage that never gets collected. And it's in the notes. They tell you all about it. So. All right, so everybody's good with the buy merchandise, get cash now, we record it all now. No problem. Give merchandise, get it dollars later. So we would have uh, accounts receivable, $600. Sale, $600. That's now. Next month they pay us. What do we get? Cash. Do I record sale again? No. no. Accounts receivable goes down. So notice these two cancel each other out. So I have sale, cash, just like it all happened in one month, but it happened at two different times. It's almost like um, accounts, like accounts receivable and accounts payable are placeholders. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
Um, the other one is cash first. So I get cash, $600, and I have a unearned revenue, $600. Okay? And then, you know, I, well, somebody comes into my bookstore and orders a book but I don't have it. When it comes in, I put it in a box and ship it to them. Now I've earned the 600 bucks, right? So now I go unearned $600, and what does it become now? It's revenue, right? Revenue or sales? $600. So the unearned cancel each other out, and this looks just like it would, except it happens at two different times. You're recording these things in your journal. You're giving these two separate transactions, different transaction numbers. Yes, because this will happen on, say, January 5, and this will happen on February uh, 13. Is there anything in that recording that links them, or you just figure it out? In the description, in the note, you can, because okay. typically up here you'll have a, a an invoice number or a tag number, right. and you'll reference the same thing down here. Okay? Everybody good at this? Okay, that's about half of the conversation for tonight, right there. <laughs> you bet. Now let's just go through them in case, because some people understand it this way better, even though I don't. You may. <laughs> You too can be a hip accountant like that, huh? <laughs> Is he cool? <laughs> I'm an accountant. What you got about that? <laughs> That's him, right? <laughs> okay. So, like I was showing you, uh, they do the revenue first. If I... What is this one here? Unearned revenue gets debited, revenue gets credited. This is when I uh, actually deliver the goods, right? <coughs> Everybody sees that. It's the bottom one I did over here. Okay. Here's one where this is where they paid me first. This is where they're going to pay me later. I get an accounts receivable and I'm going to get and I get revenue now. Good? So if you're ever using accounts receivable, that's a clue that it's already revenue. Notice if I get paid first, I'm not using accounts receivable. Okay? <clears throat> I'm skipping this slide. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, okay. Here we go. Papa John's uh, unearned franchise fees. So they went out and they sold some franchises to some people. The people gave them money. But remember, Papa John's got to train them but they haven't done the training yet. So you, you gave me money, but I haven't given you the training. What do I have? Unearned, okay? Unearned is a liability. When I do provide the service, this is, this is the adjustment. Yeah, I, I gotta relate this back to the trial balance, right? We need the adjustment. I recorded it as cash in, unearned revenue. Okay? That just that happened during the month normal transaction. At the end, we go and we look at all of our unearned and we see how much of it we've actually earned and we make an adjustment on the trial balance. Here's the adjustment. I figure, "Oh, I provided $1100 worth of services, take it out of unearned, so I debit that liability to make it go down." and I record it as revenue now that I've performed the service. So there's your adjustment. Good? Okay. Um, here we go. Papa John's franchisees owed us $830 in royalties. Okay? Um, so they report, hey, I owe you 830 bucks. We've earned the money because they owe it to us. Have I gotten the cash yet? No. So I'm going to post the adjustment based on they reported their sales. 
let's see. I'll, I wanted to cover this. Here we go. This goes back to your question earlier about when do we record the interest. Okay. So I want to stop here. Um, I don't care what that says. <laughs> we went out and we borrowed $3,000 from somebody. Okay? Simple. At 6% interest. When I record this, the, paper to the towel's over here. When I record that I borrowed the money, what do we get? What's my debit? Cash, right? Yes. I get $3,000. And I have a note payable for $3,000. I don't owe any interest yet, because this is the first day. I just borrowed it today. If I pay it back today, I don't owe any interest. Good? OK. But I borrowed the money at 6%. A month goes by. How much? interest do I owe? Well, I need to record that. That's an adjustment. So the formula for that is uh, interest equals principal times rate times time. We, know, we want to know interest. The principal we know is $3,000. We borrowed the money at 6%. Good. And, and what's time? Why do we have time in here? 6%, every, every time you see an interest rate in reference to a loan, that's an annual number. If you borrow the money for a whole year, you owe me 6% of this. 3 times 6 is 18. OK? But did we borrow it for a whole month? It's only been one month. So I need to modify the 6% to a monthly interest rate. The easiest way to do that is to convert it to months by one month divided by 12. So if I was calculating this for three months, it'd be times three divided by 12, or six months times six divided by 12. OK? Very mechanical. So could somebody, oh, it does the math for us. Uh, it, that's 15 bucks. So the interest expense for one month is $15. Everybody good? OK, one month goes by. I need to record the interest expense of $15. And what is it now? Have I, have I paid the bank the interest? No, right? So what do I do? I owe them the money now. It becomes a interest payable of $15. Remember we talked about complementary accounts before? So now what's the balance of my note payable? It's the note payable plus the interest payable. So my balance is 3015. But we track the interest in its own account and we record this $15 of interest every month. Everybody follow me? Yeah. That, this is a very common adjustment. And interest equals principal times rate times time. Happy? And once you pay the interest, it's no longer interest payable. You're down on cash. Um, does the expense go anywhere? No. no the the expense, expense goes in your income statement. It stays there forever. You know, until the end of the year. So let's, let's make the payment. Yes. Let's say we only borrowed the money for a month. Now we go pay it off. So we would be going... Note payable. Remember, it's a liability, so we have to debit that to make oops to make the balance go down. Interest payable, fifteen dollars to make the balance go down, and we send them cash like that. So we've made this cancels this. This cancels that. We borrowed the money, cash in, interest expense, cash out. Okay. Good? Yes. Okay. Questions on that? Anybody? All right. So that's interest expense. Um, interest receivable, you would calculate it the same way if somebody owes you money. And instead of being interest expense, it would be an interest receivable. And you'd record it as revenue. 
Good? Not very challenging. Um, prepaid expenses, we talked about that. Everybody know prepaid rent? We're good? Okay. Um, okay. One of the things that we've had up here on the board that we have not adjusted yet is supplies. Remember we bought some supplies, we stick them in a closet, they show up in our balance sheet as an asset. Somebody nod your head, yes, thank you. <laughs> so at the end of the month, we need to go down there and look in the supply closet and see what's left. So if we had $16,000 worth of supplies, you know, say we have a, uh, uh, a coffee shop, we got $16,000 worth of cups and sugar in the closet. At the end of the month we go count, we only have $4,000 worth of cups and sugar left in the closet. How much have we used? 12000 So we decrease the balance of our supplies asset and we increase supplies expense. Debit supplies expense, credit supplies asset. Straightforward? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody questions? Okay. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Debit expense, credit the asset, on you go. We talked about prepaids. Depreciation. <clears throat> Depreciation is matching uh, a piece of equipment with the time period that you get to use it and generate revenue. Uh, my favorite one, hey, we're talking about Papa John, so let's talk about a delivery truck. Fair enough? I'm, I'm getting real creative there, right? Okay. Papa John's goes out and they buy a delivery vehicle so some high school kid can deliver pizzas. Yes? How much did we pay for the truck? 20,000 $20, bucks. So we're going to get an asset called truck. $20,000. Let's make it simple. We paid cash. We give up $20,000 in cash. Now in the first month we sell $10,000 worth of pizza. Is this an expense? Do we write it all off against the $10,000 and show a loss of ten? dollars No. The question is, how long are we going to get to use the truck? Right? So let's assume, some, yeah, let's make some assumptions. We're going to use the truck for five years, YRS, um, and we're going to use something called straight line depreciation because it's easy. Okay? Straight line, all that means is we're going to take the same amount of depreciation every year. So if it's five years, you take, what's the formula for straight line depreciation? Cost minus the average value over the life of the truck. Okay. So the only thing I haven't defined for you is salvage value, correct? Anybody, what's salvage value? What do I think I'm going to sell the truck for five years from now? Does that sound like an estimate? Yeah. Okay. It's our best guess. So what do we think we can sell the truck for in five years? Remember, high school kids have been delivering pizzas in it. Five thousand bucks seems awfully high to me. Let's go with two. Salvage value is two thousand bucks. So my depreciation for every year, because it's straight line, is the cost of 20,000 minus the salvage of two, divide by five years. 20 minus two is 18,000. If you're doing it, let me get there in a minute. Let me just do it simple, and then we'll do it harder. But you're right. Anybody, what's 18,000 divided by 5? 36. Okay, so that's $3,600 in depreciation per year. So if we're doing annual financial statements, it's $3,600 a year. If we're doing monthly financial statements, we have to modify the life to show up in months. So five years is really what? 60 months. So 18 divided by 60 is $300 per month. 
So just know that you have to treat it appropriately depending on your accounting period. How big is it? A month or a year? I really don't need that marker. <laughs> Questions on this? What so, was the name of the ratio of cost minus that Straight line depreciation. And notice it's going to be the same number every accounting period because it's straight line. Uh, if you were to chart this, your depreciation would look like this over year one, two, three, four, five. It's the same dollars every year. Okay? There are other depreciation methods that are called accelerated methods where you depreciate more at the beginning and less at the end. And they're more involved and we're not going to do that tonight. Fair? <laughs> they use them, they use both. Either or both, it depends. You try and match the method with what you really expect will happen out of the vehicle. You know, am I going to drive it more in the first couple of years than the last two or three? Then I want to use accelerated. But if I'm going to drive it the same every year, go straight line. Okay? Do companies have both? Yep. You can pick a different method for every asset. So, I would record in our case, we came up with $300 a month, $300 depreciation expense, $300 in accumulated depreciation. What is accumulated depreciation? He didn't tell us that. It's another contra account or complementary account. Same thing. Remember, we bought a truck and we gave up cash? Bought a truck, have an asset, gave up cash. So we would have accumulated depreciation, oh sorry, do it right, depreciation expense 300, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the annual amount because it will be easier to show this. So for a whole year, depreciation expense is 3,600, uh, accumulated depreciation truck is 3,600. That's after a year. So what you end up with is a truck that stays in its own account at 20,000. An accumulated depreciation that goes 3,600, 7,200, uh, 10, 8, uh, 14, 4. Uh, 17, 18,000, and so on each year. Notice the value of the truck goes down because you have to add the two balances together to come up with the true ending va ba balance, value balance. When you add the two together, this is what's called book value of your truck. Remember, our uh, salvage value was 2,000. One, two, three, four, five. This is the last year. This is the ending balance. 20,000 minus 18 equals salvage value. And that salvage value stays on your books until you sell the truck. You just stop right here. But in total, that balance drops over time and at the end becomes equal to salvage value. But yes? Aren't you recording it monthly? Also, like I did this so I only had to do five entries instead of 60 entries to, sh to get here. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> I only have so much board space. <laughs> but yes, you are correct. You would do it monthly. Sir? The, the accumulated depreciation, does that um, represent all depreciation of all your assets that you're depreciating? Or Notice we would have an accumulated depreciation for truck. We would have one for equipment. We'd have one for building. We'd have one for office equipment. You put them in great big categories, but you know, each has its own. And even within that, you drill down to each individual asset has its own. So people usually track this on a piece of software. Okay? Everybody good? What? Yes, ma'am. So when, when do you record salvage until you dispose of the asset? Notice I didn't record salvage anywhere. 
but it's implied. It's built into how the calculation works. We drove the book value down to that two thousand dollar salvage value. So if you get to sell the truck, then you record the salvage? No. Nope. Or you would just give those things around. And Let's say we sell the truck at the end. What's my book value? The truck's worth eighteen thousand, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna erase the top part of this. Book value is two thousand. So what we do is we're going to sell the truck. How much do we sell the truck for? Somebody give me a number. $1, We're selling the truck for $1,000. Good? Yeah. Okay. So we have cost, accumulated depreciation, <coughs> gives me book value $2,000. 1,000 minus 2,000 gives me loss of $1,000. Okay? If we had sold the truck for three, I would have a gain. Notice it's not revenue, it's not expense. Remember we talked about gains and losses? Okay. Good? Help me. see the journal entry. How oh. Okay. We're going to sell the truck for 3000 bucks. Okay? So I would have cash $3000 debit. Uh, truck Remember the asset account? I make it go away for $20,000. Okay? Uh, accumulated depreciation truck $18 thousand dollars. Okay? Twenty-one, twenty. So I have gain. And I know it's a gain because it's wet. A credit. More credits than debits gives you revenue. More debits than credits gives you a loss. So twenty-one equals twenty-one. There's your journal entry. So is there a, is it like one gain loss account? Yes. Okay. Sale of fixed assets, gain or loss. One account, done. Yes, that's all one entry. Everybody good? Right on. Okay. Um, okay, accrued expenses. We've talked about that with the utilities and things. Yes, everybody's comfortable with that? There's only one thing I want to throw at you, and I'm going to come over here to do it because I need some board space. Payroll. Payroll's fun. We like payroll. <laughs> well, at the end of a month, though, remember we want to match what we have to pay our employees with the time period they worked and the revenue they generated. So if we have a week, we pay everybody weekly. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We pay everybody here. Okay? Let's say we owe everybody a uh, thousand bucks on Friday. Piece of cake, right? The first, the first entry is on the seventh of say January. You debit wages expense, you credit cash, you pay them. On the fourteenth of January, you debit wages expense, you credit cash. The twenty-first, debit wages, credit cash, and so on until the last week of January, when the thirty-first is here. Now what do I do? Right? I want to get these three days in January and these two in February. So what I do is over here, I record an adjustment for two days out of five, I'm sorry, three days out of five, right, that we're in January, times the wages. Somebody help me with the math here. 600 bucks, right? So I would record $600 of expense here and $400 of expense here and that solves the problem. But I just wanted you to see if you use the number of days it becomes pretty straightforward. Good? 
All right, questions? Answers? Can you go both in time cards if you've got wage slaves? <laughs> if you've got wage slaves, is that what you call them? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's what I am. Okay. I'm not on a salary. Yes, so what you, think about it. You're, uh, when you close a month, you typically are still working on closing the month and preparing financials, probably the Monday and Tuesday out here. So you know this number already, and you can apply this math to it because you just go to the payroll people and say, give me the total, sure. right? Not a big deal. Um, if you have to, yeah, you can go to the time cards and do the math manually and try and calculate it and create your own best estimate. All right? Wage slave. Okay. <laughs> and the optimistic award goes to. <laughs> okay, the book uses a, a term. I, I've shown you accounts payable, right? With the, with the uh, uh, utilities expense we did. Accrued expenses payable is the same thing except it differentiates between accounts payable where I've received an invoice and something that I have estimated. And when we estimate it, we call it an accrual. We're accruing the expense. So that implies I don't have an invoice for it yet, but I'll get a bill soon. And here's my estimate of what I'm going to owe. So when I do pay these, instead of debiting accounts payable, you'd end up debiting accrued expenses payable. Right? It's a language thing. They really behave the same way. Everybody comfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, same thing. Well, income taxes, they talk about uh, calculating income tax. This is simple. Take the net income before tax, apply the tax rate. We haven't paid it yet, so record the expense and record an income tax payable. This is another accrued payable. Yeah, it's a good guess at federal tax. Okay, if I give you a problem in the homework, I'll tell you, you know, net income is X, the tax rate is Y. Do this. Really straightforward, you're just doing an accrual. Skip. All right, we know about the four basic financial statements. Here's what I want to get to. This is where the rubber hits the road. We've seen this, this is your trial balance. Here's your debits and your credits, it shows it's in balance. We turn the trial balance into something called a worksheet. And we use it to post all of these adjustments. Notice we're not posting these in the general journal and general ledger. We're using this as a tool. We do the work and we record them as debits or credits here. And we show that our adjustments are in balance and we come up with an adjusted amount for each account. So if I posted a $1,100 debit to unearned, rev, unearned franchise fees, unearned franchise fees is a liability, a debit does what to the balance? Brings it down. All right? So you guys can see how to do the math. Not only do you prove it's imbalance down, but you total it across based on the debit and credit rules to get an ending balance. Those of you in 151A are looking at me going, I want to go home. Yeah. We've done this. You will not do a worksheet, but I want you to understand it. You have to. Okay, the other stuff is a great refresher of the accruals and things like that, especially since we're using some new, uh, some new terms with it. Okay, eat this stuff before you go home. All right. Um, and then you use this adjusted balance to create your financial statements, just like we've done. So again, this is just a reminder, you do the income statement first, correct? Because you need net income to go where? Stockholders' equity, statement of retained earnings. Okay? And you need ending stockholders' equity to go into your balance sheet. And then you do a statement of cash flows and you're good. Everybody happy? Everybody comfortable with this? Who's not awake anymore? Me? Everybody who had 151A. <laughs> All right. Um, 
We talked about earnings per share before, yes? Anybody have questions about earnings per share? Net income divided by the weighted average number of shares. I will give it to you if I ask you on a test to calculate earnings per share. Okay? Earnings per share is always presented on a formal financial statement, on a formal income statement, that is. Okay? Here's the, the formula for it. You've seen it before. Companies with higher earnings per share numbers usually sell for higher prices on stock exchanges. <coughs> Companies that high, have higher earnings per share, their stock sells for higher amounts on, on the stock exchange. All right. Um, Statement of stockholders' equity. I like this format where they're side by side. We talked about that before, yes? Because you can see everything that's going on. Everybody can see that? Anybody want to look at it? Anybody want to take a picture of it with your cell phone? I've had classes where students will go, hang on a second, come running up here, and go sit back down. You guys are a little bit more reserved. You put it all on Blackboard. This is on Blackboard. Even though it's on Blackboard, they'll still do it. All right, so um, there's your uh, balance sheet. What's this called? It's a classified balance sheet. Notice we've got current assets, property, plant, and equipment, other assets, current liabilities, other liabilities. They're broken apart, right? Everybody sees this. You need to get real comfortable with the format. You will see it again on a test. All right. Statement of cash flows is the, one, is the fourth financial statement. And again, the basics, it's broken down into three big sections. Cash that comes into or goes out of the company from operating activities. Cash, part two, cash that comes in or goes out from investing activities. And third part, cash that comes in or goes out from financing activities. Remember, selling company stock or buying back company stock or paying dividends is a financing activity. And always, always, you have to disclose at the bottom of your um, statement of cash flows the interest that was paid in cash during the year. Uh, cash paid for income taxes, both federal, state, you know, whatever it was. Um, and a schedule of the significant investing and financing activities. Things that happen non-cash. So think about that for a second. What is, can anyone give me an example of a non-cash investing activity? Mm, that would be a financing activity. Okay, they gave it to me as a gift. Yeah. Odds of that happening remote. So two you people are decided to go into business together and they added their assets to this to make a company. Now you okay, now you have a financing and an investing activity. So let me you're on the right path, but I want to keep it more pure to simplify it. Okay. Let me hit you with the easy one. We go out and we buy a new truck, that delivery truck and we put no money down and we finance 100% of it. Non-cash investing activity. Okay? That truck becomes an asset for no cash. Good? Okay. Oh yeah, you, it's a note payable, we owe the money. Can you disclose this in the notes? Well, you're going to you're going to disclose this at the bottom of the statement of cash flows, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sections? Yep. By the way. By the way, yeah. here's some here's some additional information for you. Inquiring minds want to know. Questions. All right. <clears throat> New ratio. I think we've seen this net profit margin. Revenue minus expenses gives you what? Net income. Remember how we calculated uh, general and administrative expenses as a percentage of sales? So 
net income divided by net sales gives you net profit margin. This tells you, I don't like their big numbers, let's make it simple. Let's say we have sales of $100. I'm going to use 100 because I can do the math in my head. And we have net income of $5. What is my net profit margin? 5%. 5% is the same as saying for every dollar of sales, I generate 5 cents in profit. So the bigger this number is, the better. So if my company generates 5% and the competitor generates 10, who's the better company? Who's performing better? The competitor. Yes, ma'am. Um, like well, that's all up above in, in deriving net sales. That's just, that's all up here. And it has nothing to do with this. Other than whatever net sales is affects this, but they're not, they're not linked. Not the way I think you're looking at it. Let's talk and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Okay. Sir. Sir, did you say for every dollar? Right? For every dollar in sales, I'm generating five cents in profit. Five percent, right? Yes, sir. I was just going to ask, like we were doing earlier, like Rachel was saying, talking about the discount. Um, is that you just, <coughs> you're estimating that cost so you have something to make the adjustment off of later? No, no, no. You don't, di you don't estimate the discount. Okay, you, estimate the, given, you estimate the returns. The returns, okay. Okay. So you're creating a number so you have something to work with when the return actually happens. Right. Good? Other questions? Okay, so a couple more slides, we'll go home. Fair? I'm just trying to push through and go home here. Um, remember when we started, there was that fourth, uh, fourth box up here, closing the month, and I said revenue minus expenses is net income. Positive net income increases retained earnings. Negative net income decreases retained earnings. Good? So how do we do that in, in our double entry accounting system? And there are two types of accounts. We've had accounts on the board all night long, T accounts, right? Uh, we've had cash, we've had equipment, so all your assets, we've had liabilities, revenue and expenses. Those break down into two different types, what are called temporary and permanent accounts. So the basics to this is, all of your balance sheet accounts are permanent. They never go away. So if I have cash in the bank, you know, and all of a sudden January turns into February, February 1, the bank calls me up and says, hey, your money's gone? No, right? It's still my money. It's permanently mine until I spend it. Um, if I have uh, accounts receivable, does my customer say, oh no, it's, it's February now, I don't owe it to you? No, it's a permanent account, right? However, we want to calculate profitability month by month, accounting period by accounting period. So all of our revenues and expenses at the end of a month, we zero them out so that we can start over and track how much profit we made in February. Right? Otherwise, if you don't zero them out, all of a sudden all you know is, here's my profit for January and February. Does that do me any good? Sort of, but not as much. So to do that, we take all of the revenue accounts. Revenues are typically what balance? Credit. Credit. We debit them all. We take all the expense accounts, which are typically debits. We credit those. The difference between the two is net income, right? We take that, we go straight to retained earnings with it. So all of those zero out and their net balance ends up in retained earnings. Boom, we're done. Life is good. And we're ready to start February. So this is every month? Every month. And that's called closing. You do it at the end of the year, but December is another month. Okay? It's to keep track of 
in individual months. Profitability. The changes and stuff. So right. Does it get all mixed together? Correct. But you have to post, I mean, from the journal to the library in order to close. Yes. Right. So, so I'm, I'm hoping for more slides here. Here we go. This is not as good as if we had a trial balance. Actually, I may back up. So here's your income statement. We're going to zero all these out, and we're going to move the net income of $7,590 to retained earnings. So the two revenue accounts up here, um, everything with a credit, they get debited to zero them out. All of these expense accounts get credited to zero them out. And notice we go to retained earnings with the $7,590 profit. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Now typically you don't do it off of your income statement. You do it off of dun, 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 your adjusted trial balance. So you come over here and you go <clears throat> here's revenue. You start here. Debit this, debit this, debit this, debit this. Credit, 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 credit. Post the other to retained earnings. You're done. So <clears throat> after you close these, you create what's called a post-closing trial balance to prove that you did it right and you're still in balance. And a post-closing trial balance only has assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity on it. It doesn't even show revenues and expenses because they're all zero. Fair enough? Confusing as mud? Hey, just seeing if you're awake. <laughs> Do, go. Questions on this? <clears throat> okay, post closing trial balance only has balance sheet accounts in it. Good? I think. This is the last slide. I'm right. <laughs> All right, questions before we go. All right, so do your homework for next time. It's, this is starting to get more involved, so the homework becomes more important, okay? Make sure you come and ask questions about the homework. Also, next week is when the market goes on, how we should do, right? The market analysis is due. If you have questions about that, let me know. But the instructions are pretty good. Okay. Go ahead.